There isn't just one action that can stop COVID in its tracks, but taking personal measures and building healthy habits will help to protect us all. COVID-19 spreads in confined spaces, crowded places and close contact settings. Wash your hands regularly and practice good hand hygiene. Carry a face covering at all times and wear it in any crowded or busy places. Increase your distance when you can and seek out fresh air either by meeting outdoors or increasing ventilation indoors. These little personal steps will really help add up and protect not only you, but those around you. Lateral flow device kits are available free of charge to everyone in the Isle of Man. You can order them online at gov.im forward slash COVID-19 or collect them from any participating pharmacy. It is recommended that everyone test every three to four days. In the last few weeks, almost 70% of positive PCR tests were identified thanks to an initial LFD test, making them a really important tool to uncover hidden cases of the virus. Vaccinations are effective in preventing severe illness, hospitalisation and even death. The vaccination programme is available to all island residents aged 16 and over and provides our greatest collective defence and ability to manage COVID-19 long term. It takes just one minute to register for the COVID-19 vaccination and it could save you from severe infection. Be safe, be smart, be kind for our island. Hello and welcome to Election 21 Question Time. In this edition, we feature the candidates looking to represent the constituency of Arbury, Castletown and Maloo. Joining me on the panel are, in alphabetical order, Graeme Kajin, Steve Crowther, Tim Glover and Jason Morehouse. Following the general election on September the 23rd, two of them will be elected to the House of Keys. Before we start the questions, each candidate is given up to two minutes to introduce themselves. And first up, we have Graeme Kajin. Graeme. Thank you. It was an honour to be elected by the constituents of Maloo and Santon in 2006 and then returned as their representative to the House of Keys in 2011 general election. Following the boundary change, it was an honour to have the trust and voters of Arbury, Castletown and Maloo placed in me when I was returned to the House of Keys in 2016. I am now seeking your support to be your MHK for the next five years. Using valuable skills and experience my time serving you has given me. I have strong connections to the south of the island, having been brought up in Port St Mary, where along with my father and my brother, served on the community as members of Port St Mary Lifeboat and Russian Emergency Ambulance. I have been a coach at both Maloo Football Club and Southern Swimming Club. I also marshal at the Southern 100. I worked for and then ran the family business prior to a period of teaching at Isle of Man College before joining the post office. Each administration I have served in has faced a unique set of challenges and I have never shied away from hard work and tough decisions these challenges bring. My aim has always been and will continue to be to serve the people of Arbury, Castletown and Maloo by seeking resolution to issues through a common sense approach whilst focusing on the long-term prosperity of the Isle of Man. I was fortunate to be able to serve as a minister in the last administration and achieve some of what I had set out in my manifesto, such as a new school for Castle Russian, preschool vouchers and a maintenance grant for students. The next administration must address the issues of COVID 
which has created, and I believe this will uh, require people with a track record of hard work and skills and knowledge of how government works to be successful. Sorry, Gra oh, thank you, Graham. Just about to wrap you up there. Next, we have Steve Crowther. Thank you. My name's Steve Crowther. I'm an architect. I've worked um, internationally. I studied at Council Russian. Um, I've worked uh, around the world. Uh, I uh, came back to the Isle of Man uh, in 2003. Uh, we, I was married. I wanted my young daughter to go to Castle Russian and, um, you know, grow up in the same um, environment that I had. Fundamentally to me at the moment, we have a key problem. The issue is that after the last administration, I believe that our constituency had an incredible opportunity. It had a great legacy. And I just want to run through that. First, there's a school, which at the moment is looking like a muddy field. Then we have the second item, which was the housing review. This was an incredible opportunity. We had a real chance to really to achieve the first time buyer homes that we need in Castletown and the constituency. But the key area for me uh, was uh, moving into the environment and really bringing things together. We had uh, a technology park proposed opposite the airport. Again, we've had absolutely nothing. Uh, there's a suggestion about a planning application, but we're five years on. And this was the key to really high-skilled jobs that we need in our constituency. We have an airport. We have two stunning centres at each end, and now is our chance to really see that happen. We've got to see a real change in our constituency and, and the inward investment in the Isle of Man that we need. It's really essential going forward. What I believe is we haven't really offered our youth the potential for the future. I, if I have the honour of being elected, I believe I can deliver on these key areas in the coming administration. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Tim Glover. The last 18 months have been like nothing we've been through before. Now we can be inhibited or we can use this as an opportunity. I'm a glass half full sort of guy and I believe that this general election is an ideal opportunity to press the reset button. There is a mood from being on the doorsteps for change. I believe we need a government that is going to think strategically, have thoughtful policies, no return to austerity, cut bureaucracy, stop the waste, be a government for the people and have a social conscience. Government should be for the people and not there to hinder. I believe we've got a great opportunity to make those changes if we go in with confidence and use the nimbleness of the Isle of Man. I um, out there for all of you to see. I am out of work because I am out there trying to earn your trust and your vote. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Jason Morehouse. Thank you. From my perspective, the strength and growth of the island's economy is a key priority over the next five years. Without this, our young people will not return home, businesses will not grow, and people and businesses will not come to the island. Economic success will ensure that things like the development of the new school at Castle Russian will take place. Over the last five years, I've become a community-based MHK. I've always been there, and a good link between local people and national government. I am someone who gets things done and prepared to say no when that is required. In the last five years, I've been one of the most active MHKs in terms of asking questions, bringing motions, and getting things done. I've also been on three important parliamentary committees. The Education Committee was created to assess the Education Bill and the Beeman's Report. That committee was fundamental in ensuring that the legislation was abandoned and a new way forward can be found. The Poverty Committee was able to bring a range of recommendations in July, all of which were recommended by Tinwald and will have a massive impact on some of the most needy people in our island. The Economic Policy Review Committee has carried out an active role in assessing key ministers 
and actions such as Vision 9. I have brought several successful Timor Moshe's and those will ensure that going forward, topics such as, such as first time by housing, the size of government, and the return of Pe the Peggy to Castletown will be discussed. Going forward, a focus on the economy is key. The biosphere and our unique heritage will ensure that we're all in a better place in five years' time. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. I've been reading up on all the candidates around all the constituencies around the island and uh, there's plenty of wish lists out there. One popular one is to grow the economy. How do we grow the economy, Steve Crowther? Thank you. I think the key area for me, and, and this is um, something that's really let us down in the last government, and I, I could give examples here for our incumbents, but the, the difficulty is confidence in our government. The departments have too many arguments and it's really putting off to you know, the large scale inward investors. But the interesting thing in the Isle of Man is that we actually have a lot of the high net worth individuals here who want to who invest. So this is why I've spent five years helping a local entrepreneur develop an eco house system that's for affordable homes. And you know, this is already attracting the interest that we need I want to develop a climate technology park opposite the airport. Uh, this is exactly the image that we need to project internationally, and it also brings the high skills we need within our community. And that's really the key to going forward. That, that affordable home is alone going to bring our first time buyers the key to unlocking that area of the market. Again, it's about confidence in government. They need to be clear, and we also need the um, joined up strategy so that people aren't put off with silly arguments between government departments. Thanks. Graham Cregeen, your view? I think one of the areas that we really do have to address is uh, planning legislation, because that's been a blocker for, uh, for industry. I've been working with a number of businesses to try and, and, and get them involved in the south of the island, and you come across planning processes that have been in for uh, far too long. It's key that we actually change that. We also need to make sure that when people come to the Isle of Man and even try to expand on the island, that there's people there who are able to handhold them through the processes and make that as easy as possible. And, and I agree that there are issues regarding how uh, inter-government communications go on. But those are areas that, that I feel that can be addressed quite quickly. And what you need is you need people who are actually in there, who know the system, who are able to go and say, right, this, this has to happen. Um, I, I've been working with Department for Enterprise and the Department of Infrastructure to get these companies relocated. And sometimes, you know, over the COVID period, trying to have those face-to-face -face meetings which off-island companies want has been very difficult. And I would say that once the borders are eased and we can get those people coming to the island and seeing what a wonderful place we have, then we'll get that inward investment. Thank you. So, Jason Morehouse, we've heard about planning, green future. What's your view? I think we need to have a wider environment in terms of a place where things can be done. There's too much red tape on the island. We've focused on having a place that can be trusted of international standing. And by doing that, some businesses have struggled. We must actually take a step back whilst retaining all the key pieces of legislation we've got. We must have an awareness that local businesses need the support to thrive. Too many entrepreneurs are out there wanting to get to the next step. And at the moment, they need that push. Five years ago, I think enterprise did move forward in a good way in terms of the agencies. But we now need the support at a local level, ensuring that local entrepreneurs really move forward. In terms of the airport technology gateway, it's a fantastic location, and it's been a real struggle to bring together the parcels of land, to bring together the ideas. And I think in the coming months, the next key step there will really see things change and hopefully be the spot that gets things going. Thank, Thank you. you. Tim Glover, the agencies were touted as the solution to all our problems in terms of growing the economy. How do you see things? I see that government is far too clunky. It lacks confidence. I've spoken to businessmen, uh, one uh, who was trying to get to the uh, technology, not to the technology part, but to uh, the Freeport, 
uh, a business involving uh, super yachts. He's been waiting two and a half years to find out whether he's going to be able to move there. That's not acceptable. People will just move on. I'm disappointed that the technology gateway has not been utilised at all. It's still barren. I'm talking to a, another businessman who is a, a children's television production worker. Now, he is talking about bringing 100 jobs to the island. It's not a business that is going to be people here for six months. We're not being scarred by the uh, Media Development Fund on that front. But he's waiting for decisions and waiting for promises that were made when he brought his business here. Again, that's unacceptable. We're not going to get business to thrive on the island. Government needs to have some confidence. You have to speculate at times to accumulate. And we have an opportunity at the, uh, the airport, the gateway there, to bring green technology to the island and set an example to the rest of the world. We're nimble enough to do it if the desire within government is there to do it. Government recently created uh, the Manx Development Corporation, so some more highly paid public servants to deliver the, uh, what couldn't be delivered before. Will you be lobbying this new body to ensure that the airport gateway gets priority over Douglas Brown's field sites? Graham Krajim. Um, it's it's uh, one of the areas that I've been looking at, and uh, the company that uh, Tim mentioned I've been dealing with recently and you know I, I lobbied not for, for that land not to go to the development agency because that would have actually put at least another six months on on that development so by actually sort of circumventing the development agency uh, we're now in a position that hopefully in the next couple of weeks we should have an outcome for that business and it we have officers in departments who should have been doing that in the first place. And it does seem strange that we create a, a very expensive development agency that actually should be doing the things that the civil servants were there to do in the first place. But as, as a politician, I think it's our job to handhold these, these companies to try and open the doors. And if you have to, then you have to kick the doors in to get these things done. But ultimately, the minister is the department. And through my department, Department of uh, Home Affairs, we have simplified legislation to encourage businesses uh, with the licensing law, which has actually reduced bureaucracy and reduced the cost to industry. Thank you. Jason Morehouse, yeah, I, do you see the Manx Development Corporation as a, as a help or a hindrance in terms of development in the constituency? I think it's got potential and everything that's able to help us move forward must be grasped. In terms of bureaucracy, that's always a danger with government, that too much time is wasted and we need to be responding to what these entrepreneurs are requiring. Too many entrepreneurs are saying they've come to the island, they've been invited here, they've been offered incentives and they've got here and it's not as good as they first thought. We need to ensure it's better than they expected and that is really key priority. And as politicians and civil servants, that must be a key thing, looking at what we've got but trying to take that to the next level rather than just going to the next item and trying to move forward by doing that. We've got a lot of key assets that have been underutilised and we must ensure that those entrepreneurs are happy and actively doing what they want to do here. Thank you. Thank you. Tim Glover, I think I've heard over the last several elections cutting red tape and bureaucracy has been an ambition of every aspiring politician. How do we actually get more, well, less bureaucracy and uh, more, maybe more accountab accountability from the civil servants? Well, it has to be a major priority. It's disappointing to be sitting here and five years on, we're talking about the airport technology gateway once again, which is just an area of grass and nothing has happened. It's disappointing to hear stories of businesses. I've got frustrated, that's why I'm standing, because I want to raise these issues and call it out. It needs doing within the House of Keys and within Timwald when things are not progressing as they should be. It's too clunky. We've got to trim it down and we've got to make uh, government be a, an aid to getting businesses here rather than the hindrance. And that's what it is, I'm afraid, at the moment. It's, something has to change because we're hearing all the same things that we heard five years ago, five years on. 
Thank you. Steve Crowther, do you have any... Well, can I just come back to this development Sorry, yeah. corporation? Right, let's just finish this question. Let's cut to the chase. I have two incumbents here, and neither of them have talked to Alleman Enterprises, who own half the land, in five years. I talked to them in five days. It's absolutely essential that we know where we're going to go with this technology park. This is the key to jobs in this constituency, and that's how we've lost it. You know, the, the key factor here, as I mentioned earlier and Tim's relating to, is that we don't have the joined up aspect. So we've got a minister who wants a bit of PR, gets his picture in the paper on the elm trees. We could have dealt with that so much better by talking to the minister. And these are key factors that are really affecting our government. It's the fact that inward investors just think, well, I talked to one department, but I've got to talk to the other. To be fair, Graham raised a point about planning. So we've now got enterprise and planning, which are in two separate departments, and they can't work together. So let's take glamping, perfect example. There's real potential. Every time you open the paper, you can see that other areas are focused, they know what they're doing. We haven't even got off the ground. And the excuse given to me is, well, you know, it was COVID, nothing's really going on. But we need to be up and running. And that's what I think, I think Tim's referring to. We need a new strategy to get us off the ground. And that's joined up government. Thank you. Just Thank want to you. move it on now we need to confidence as yep. well. We need confidence. confident government to be ambitious and confident and get the job done rather than trying to uh, defer it to some other department or make an excuse as to why that can't go on. Government should be nimble and actually helping business. Not Focus. hindering, be really focused. Okay, okay thank you. I just, I just want corrections, please, in terms of what's been said. In terms of speaking to the landowners, in terms of trying to move things forward, I've been there. You and haven't also, spoken to Alleman Enterprises. Yeah, I have, yeah. In five years, you yes, haven't I have, yeah, to definitely. No, you haven't. I, I can't I prove haven't spoken to the director. You escape. haven't spoken to them. Jason. There's, there's more than one director there. Uh, I'm, but I'm just, sure, just, I'm, but also in terms of asking questions about this, pushing it forward, you can look at the Tim World, the records there have been doing that every three months at least. Thank I'm, you. I'm sure the viewers will have their own views on uh, who said what. Um, I just want to move the subjects on because we have limited time, of course. Local first-time buyers are finding it increasingly difficult to get a foot on the property ladder. What policies would you support to rectify this? Tim Glover. I think this has got to be an area of discussion very early in the next administration as a major priority. We've got to create a market where there's affordable housing for youngsters to be able to keep them on the island. It's essential we do that for our economy and our economic growth. I think we've got to have nothing off the table. We have a proper discussion about everything. I'm glad to see that government has recognised, rather after the horse has bolted though, that their schemes for first-time buyers were totally out of sync with the reality of what the market is. They talk about at the moment a property, two-bedroom property or a flat to the value of 140 to 190,000 across the schemes. Will you tell me where you're going to find that at the moment? You just aren't. So we've got to not rule anything in or anything out. We even look at even a split market. That there's too many developments where affordable housing is being bought by a developer and then rented out. That has to stop. That has to stop. Those houses have got to be for first-time buyers to be actually living in. Thank you. Jason Morehouse? This has been a huge frustration for several years. I brought a motion in January and the infrastructure minister said updates will be coming soon. And I've been pushing for several, on several occasions. I've asked many questions. And last week I said to Minister Baker, we must see this before the election. We've got over 50 candidates going around suggesting different things. Unfortunately, we got a rough outline of what they were thinking of in terms of higher salaries, a higher price of property, but it's still fundamentally incredibly basic. We need to ensure that those local people can afford a house. Without that, they'll look elsewhere. The UK government's put lots of energy, lots of funding into this exact area, and their young people have got an advantage that ours haven't. And we need to ensure that the next government bridges that gap and does better. Because without that, the local people are going to have a disadvantage. And it's not as though there are even alternatives. The price of private property is so high. These people have got so few things going for them and we really need to be there finding out the best solution and grabbing hold of it while we can. Thank you. Steve Crowther? Well, I think that, you know, the summary is it's pushing on and moving on. 
the truth is that um, we haven't seen anything. And the key area within our own constituency was the housing review. It's now flat on the floor. It's going nowhere. And this was fundamental. The, the inspector who worked in the 2006 area plan review identified the need for first time buyer houses. When I walk around the estates at the current time, there are so many people. You know, we, we get these comments that people have a nice car out the front and they're hogging the social, you know, uh, housing. The truth is, a lot of people want to get into the housing market, but they can't get out. They're stuck. And this is the thing that we need to work on. We need to free up our young people to have a future. I've worked with a local entity, as I mentioned. I have a new concept for a, an eco-home that is a four-bedroomed house. It's a very clever piece of technology. And it means to ens it ensures that someone can buy a first-time buyer's house in the region of 180K. Yes, as Tim's saying, it needs a, a, an immediate strategy to ensure that that will work in terms of uh, you know, the legalities. But that's exactly what legislators are for. That's how we need to move on. We need doers, not talkers. Thank, Thank you. you. Graham, Regine. I think what we've seen in the past is the big developers have gone around the island. They've taken lots of options. And you know, we had uh, uh, the, the new development that's uh, in Balasala. And I understand the option had been taken by a developer for many years on that prior to any work. Now, government is the owner of some land in, in Balasala in the north of the island. That gives us the opportunity to go back to what we did years ago as a buy to build scheme. So you can have joint equity because the person then only has to look at actually building the property and getting the mortgage for this price of the property because the land is already bought. So we can move on with that. And the other ones that we're, we've done in the past is that over the COVID period, we've actually seen the government give um, business loan guarantees. So maybe what we can do is we can expand that as a loan guarantee to uh, first time buyers. This will give the banks the surety that they will know that there's money back in because sometimes what I hear is that they can go for a mortgage and they're only allowed a mortgage to a certain level whereas the, the price of the house is a bit further. If the government then puts that guarantee in there, that will be really beneficial for first time buyers and that's really areas that we should be addressing rather quickly. It's Thank repossession you. laws, that's the key. Thanks. Tim, you wanted to add something? Also government, as Graham alluded to, owns a lot of land. Uh, it owns a lot of brownfield sites as well that are currently available. So why not go back to what used to happen where government sold plots of land? Bella Lock was built that way. Thank you. Just on this, just a quick it's a simple yes, solution. A quick yes or no from each of you. Would you be in favour of putting restrictions on off-island based investors purchasing property in the Isle of Man with the intention of letting it out? Graham Cregine? Yes. Steve Crowder? No, I want new legislation. Tim? Yes. Jason? Yes, for an initial period to find out the impact of that. Thank you. OK, I believe we have some questions from the audience. I'd like to hear the candidates' views on uh, local authority reform. Thank you. Jason Morehouse? Yeah, I think this is something we've waited too long for. And at the moment, we're getting piecemeal change and... I think the next government needs to be more outgoing and bigger thinking in terms of what could be achieved. There's almost some embarrassment towards this. And we saw the merger of um, Arbery and Russian, and it was sending quite a low key when. It, it would perhaps have been better if the whole south of the island had actually looked at those possibilities, rather than allowing one thing to happen at one moment in time. That was good, there were, were advantages to doing it, but at the same time, there are limits, and that could impact in terms of what Malou wants to do, in terms of what Castletown wants to do. So I think we need to have some really good open discussions in the initial weeks of the next administration and really try and grasp a clear strategy on what we can do in this area. Because at the moment, it's just being kicked from one administration to the next, and nothing's really being done. Thank you. Thank you. Tim Glover, where do you stand on this? I believe uh, government does need to get more involved uh, and talk with the local authorities. It's letting mergers happen organically amongst uh, the local authorities rather than actually sitting down and talking to the local authorities and trying to find out uh, what's best. 
I believe the MHKs have got to work very closely with the local authorities and I rang on my declaration the three clerks of the three areas, Arbury, Castletown and Maloo, to inform them of my decision because I think that's the way forward that the politicians who are elected nationally have got to work with the local politicians and all three boards say that the biggest problem they're facing in dealing with anything is the Department for Infrastructure and getting answers from them seems about as, uh, well, <laughs> if you get an answer, why, my goodness me, uh, you just get a long, long wait. So let's sit down. There is a lot more sharing of resources going on uh, between the local authorities at the moment. That can be encouraged. That's referring to bin collections and uh, other areas. But let's sit down and have a big adult grown-up talk between government and the local authorities to see if we can start to reduce the level of, uh, and the amount of local authorities and politicians involved at that local level. Thank you. Graeme, Regine? Um, a number of years ago I went round all the local authorities and spoke to them regarding change. And at the time there were some of them that were welcoming, others were not. Um, if you take the uh, southern authorities, um, you're in the region of sort of four or five hundred thousand pounds worth of administration just in the, in the south of the island. And that, that seems quite excessive for what, you, what uh, services are being provided there. What we've got is we've got the uh, joint boards for the civic amenity site, the swimming pool. We've now got the joint housing board. So why can't they all just work together on the civic amenity site and say let's do refuge as a, a whole uh, uh, for the south of the island because you've got Port Erin, you've got bin wagons, Ports at Mary, Malou, Castletown brings in somebody, so does Arbury and Russian. These can be done and they, there can be efficiencies. And one of the problems that we had was um, in the last administration they, tra they transferred some services over to the local authorities. So if you look at the, um, the gullies, so the gully parts are op op uh, cleared by the local authority. But if the drain is blocked past that, you've got to get the DOI in. Surely what we can do is transfer that into one authority, deal with that, and go back to the time when we had parish gangs who were going around the areas of the Isle of Man that they were responsible for, that can, that can fill the potholes, clear the weeds, which is what the people want, tidy the island up. It's looking tired at the moment, and I think if government and local authorities work together, we're going to make this a better place for people to come and a better place for residents to, to, to have their children grow up in. Thank you. Steve Crowther? Yeah, I think, you know, the key area here is just to take a bigger picture for a second. Uh, I really appreciate the, the question, Carol. You know, the, the thing is, we, at the moment, there are a lot of legal issues that are arising. For example, HR. Uh, planning, which is much more complicated. So where, you know, a, a smaller local authority could deal with those issues with one or two, you know, clerks or, you know, individuals. The problem is it's so much more complex. So in a way, there's a huge push anyway to achieve something that's more uh, efficient and can cope with these uh, new areas. But the key factor for me is that there is actually... Sorry. The, the key factor for me is that we've got this local connection. So it's how to integrate those two things together. You know, and our constituency has three completely different elements to it, if you like. And so we could combine into a southern area, but is there a two-tier system possible? Because what the southern area needs, for example, we're desperate for a new pool. Our road infrastructure is desperate for review. It's fundamental uh, to, to cope with future capacity. So. A, a, southern, a southern area, um, in effect, uh, grouping could actually present something better to government to represent. And that's where the MHKs need to work together with that group. Thank you. Tim, you want to add something? I'm just going to say briefly that central government has passed on more responsibility to uh, local authorities, but some of those local authorities don't have the resource to be able to action those responsibilities. So, in effect, it's forcing the local authorities to actually put rates up to be able to afford to do them. So, actually, central government isn't offering a solution there. It's creating more problems for the multiple local authorities. Thank you. Any more from the panellists on that well, question? Well, youth is losing out as well. Yeah. Really losing out. Okay, thank you. Do we have another question? Yeah. Yeah, the island, the island has... Um, gained world biosphere status 
Um, and yet, I see very little evidence of us actually anything, of really doing anything positive to maintain that. Um, as an example, I mean, I've been campaigning uh, with gov to government for many, many years in regard to a, a whole range of issues of sustainability. Um, most particularly in 2010, Exeter University third year uh, environmental group came over um, effectively uh, as a, a default because they couldn't go where they were supposed to because of the volcanic dust activity. They produced a 300-odd page, I think 326-page report on the potential of the Isle of Man in terms of energy, energy efficiency and a whole range of subjects. Now, I've talked to various members of government ministers and others about this over the years. Most of them didn't even know about it. And certainly there's been no action taken on it. Um, and then this leads into the whole issue of housing. Um, the question of how we build houses still on the Isle of Man, we're still using techniques that the Victorians would recognize. Developers are building... Sir, to, sorry, to, do you have a question yes, for sorry, the panel? The question, Thank the, you. The, sorry, the question is, um, we need to legislate to make things happen, not talk. What, you know, can the, protect the candidates tell me what they are specifically going to do to bring forward legislation that will make developers build to standards that, are that will meet the requirements of biosphere status and sustainability in the future? Okay, thank you. Graham Trajean? Well, like I said earlier, um, our planning legislation is really out of date. And part of the, the, the planning legislation will take that into it, as well as building control. One of the areas on building control that they've looked at previously is about insulation standards. Uh, and there, there has been a few issues about if people have extensions, how much of that property will then have to be brought up to the, the new standard. This could have actually, in some places, um, prohibited people from doing work on their property because it would include most of the house being updated. I think what we need to do, first of all, is, is put new standards in for new housing. We've already seen a £6,000 uh, grant being put towards um, environmental standards for properties. So there's more that we can do. So I would say that what we need to do is review uh, and replace our planning uh, law and also our building control. Thank you. Steve Crowder, you're, you're, no, you're keen to utilise the biosphere status? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, How I do. do. This? And, uh, well, actually, I, it's quite a long question, that, John. Uh, so I'll try and break it down into two sections. Uh, the first was about the biosphere, and I think... Um, we're absolutely right. This is fundamental. I've, I went to the presentation for candidates on the biosphere. It's very clear that it's, it's very well put together, but if I ask the audience you know, any detail, not many people are aware or can really describe what this is about. And the fundamental here is that actually it's a huge international accolade and it gives us a real potential to encourage the investment that we need and it also works with the environmental issue. You know, it brings things together. But interestingly, you know, I, I've been talking to people to demonstrate that the issue at currently, losing banks, post offices, the way we're treating our senior generation, you know, as if they're sort of past a sell-by date, is a key issue. And it doesn't marry at all with the biosphere concept. So that's a fundamental issue. Coming into the environment that, that you're asking about and, and buildability, John, I think the, the question is, I've been talking about the eco-house system, and this is exactly where we need to do, you know, where we need to work. It's fundamental, and as we mentioned earlier, we we're covering ground here, we need the planning legislation that allows us to help those first-time buyers into the marketplace, and it guarantees them the quality. So, essential. Thank you. Thank Jason Morehouse? Yeah, two key areas. In terms of the biosphere, that is something that's incredible, and it really needs to be pushed forward and developed in terms of tourism, but also the well-being of the island's people. Too often there's that assumption that it's not even there, there's just, people don't even notice it. And I've asked many questions about this, I've really tried to push DEFRA in terms of, can more be done in terms of what we've got here? It's potentially not forever, and unless we actually make strides forward and actually build on what we've got, it's something we could lose. In terms of the property, it's really key that we look at that, not just in terms of new buildings, but also the buildings we've got. There's a massive movement towards the green agenda. 
and the big shiny things that are getting too much emphasis. We really must be focused on things like insulation and giving more support for that. More emissions come from buildings than anything else. And we need to make sure that those buildings are improved but also future-proofed. The people living there will have to pay less for their bills, it'll end fuel po poverty, and everyone will be better off. So two really important areas that I hope the next government really do consider and take on. Thank you. Thank you. Tim Glover? I think we should be singing and dancing about our biosphere status. Uh, it almost goes unnoticed, I think, to people visiting the island. But I think your specific question was, what legislation would you bring in uh, uh, on property matters? And I think straight away, any new development or any new house now should fit with eco standards. We're building houses in the south of the island at the moment that could well have to need to be retrofitted again in five years' time. Where's the sense in that? And I must applaud Castletown uh, commissioners because their uh, public sector housing they're putting in at School Hill and West Hill, it's not quite eco, but it's about as eco as it can be. And we should follow that example with any new development now on the island. It should meet eco standards and that should be brought in as part of the planning legislation through the House of Keys and Timwell that no more builds now of non-eco housing. Well, we have the option. The options are, are here now. We Thank need to you. take them up. Thank you. Do you have another question? Bank of, Bank of England Governor says we're going to the worst situation financially we've ever been in. Great Britain and its surrounding islands. How are we going to pay for your wish list? OK, I think we, we may have touched on a similar topic in the first question, but uh, Tim Glover, we've got a... Uh, economic pain now and, and, and possibly into the future as well how do we how do we get through it well one thing is to stop the waste that government is uh, currently uh, spewing out if I might use that phrase with the Liverpool landing stage with, with capital projects that just aren't managed well I am in favor of what's being talked about where we have this uh, central unit within government that actually takes on all major capital projects it's, and it's a professionally run body. It sees them from procurement right through the managing the whole process and making sure budgets and timescales are met and right through to the end where all the snagging issues are dealt with, etc. That could potentially save us long millions that currently we are wasting. That's just one area of smarter, more strategic government which will actually save us some money. Uh, as for the rest, it's about attracting business to the island. We've got the green economy, which I think is a great opportunity. Uh, look at the example that Orkney uh, is setting where since 2016, they've had uh, green electric being produced there. Uh, we're behind the ball game. There's been a, a reluctance to accept that we need to address the issue of climate change. There's been a reluctance in a lot of areas to accept a lot of things, for example, poverty on the island. We need to have government working smarter, much more strategically and with well thought out policy. Thank you, Graham Crugeen. I think when, when, when you're looking at the Isle of Man economy, uh, we suffered from probably about 20 odd years ago uh, when we had that huge expenditure from the uh, Manx Electricity Authority, that debt that, that has been actually put on to possibly our grandchildren from uh, projects back then. Um, we, we've, we've currently uh, going through uh, refinancing of some of that and that's actually been uh, quite beneficial because we're actually saving a, a large percentage of interest from the old loan to the new money that we're refinancing on. We have to make sure that what we're looking for is actually sustainable. Um, and this new project group that uh, Tim's talking about, you have to make sure that you have the right people in there because some of the projects that we've had in the past have actually been driven by trying to make it cheap rather than actually the lifespan costs of it. And that's driven um, some of the schemes that we've seen that have then over, over uh, run their costs. So what we've got to do is have proper budgets on it for, for lifetime costs. And I, I hope that when that group gets together, they will have the experience in there. But we also need to make sure that we've got people coming over here and our own residents who have got the ability to sustain our economy because we have got 
pensions, we've got um, a lot of things that we have to pay for. We've got the £250 million of COVID costs that have to be repaid. And what you'll find is there'll be countries around the world who will also be looking to try and recoup their costs and they will be looking at our shores and our businesses as well. So we have to make sure that our businesses here are secure for our young people. Thank you. Steve Crowther, one of uh, government's uh, solutions... Sorry, can we just, I'm just going to address that gentleman's question? Or? That's, I was going to lead oh, it. Oh, sorry, was it? I thought we'd move <laughs> on. Sorry. Far away. Yeah, it's fine. Sorry, uh, what, what was your name, sorry? Jim. 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 Well, I don't know if you were happy with those answers, but let me be very clear. You're absolutely right. We get this wish list, it was the key word you used, and this is the key problem we have in the Isle of Man at the current time. I appreciate the department and the resources and the people we're going to put in it who are professional. The key issue for me is that the way forward, and I've worked internationally on these projects, I've seen airports and major structures developed uh, around Asia. The key is joint venture. It's using private investment and making sure that they bring to the table the right expertise. I don't mind some people in government having you know, the capabilities, but that reinforces things. Exactly what should have happened with the pier in Liverpool. It was a good idea to have a slot. It'll become like Heathrow in the, that entire redevelopment in the future. But why do we have to do it? Mention pension pots and whatever, like we did with the hospital. We can actually bring the inward investment, which is what I was talking about, making sure we're joined up and that we're attractive. People don't want to invest their money if they feel they're going to trip over their own shoelaces when they've committed that kind of money. It's a joint venture, and let's have the right government to attract the investment. Thank you. Thank you. Jason Mohouse. Thank you for asking this question. From my perspective, this is the key thing we should be considering. The government is still in a good position. We've got big reserves, but we're on a crucial turning point. And many constituents have been surprised on the doorstep that in June, Timwell actually accepted a £400 million bond proposal. And basically, that wasn't new money. It was just restructuring existing debt with Steam Packet, the MUA, and giving infrastructure £50 million. And that does concern me. We really need to live within our means. We also must recognise the importance of local business. At the moment, many local businesses are incredibly stressed after COVID. But those businesses provide the employment, they provide the growth that we need. And whatever government does is going to be irrelevant if those local businesses don't survive and go forward and grow. And I think it's really essential that the Enterprise Minister in the next government really takes on as a priority, ensuring that local businesses can go forward and get the support they need. There's a lag time happening and many are considering restructuring and there could be major consequences in the period between now and Christmas. Thank you. Government's solution to living within its means, Jason, has uh, apparently been since 2016, adding several more hundred people to the payroll. Is government too big? Definitely. And I brought a motion in June asking that very question. And Comin have gone off and in January, ahead of the programme for government, they're going to be coming back with recommendations which the new members of Tim will, will discuss and hopefully have that as a perfect opportunity to say, this is wrong. It's time to take a step back, to use what we've got more effectively and do things right. Because at the moment, we've just, we're filling posts, we're creating posts without thinking of the long-term consequences. Thank you. Tim Glover? Again, we go back to what we heard five years ago. Uh, we heard five years ago that there was going to be a push to make governments slimmer and smarter. From it's the Chief Minister, uh, from I everyone, as well. From everybody at these uh, constituency debates that were happening five years ago, that was a big commitment amongst the candidates. Instead, government has actually increased by over 500 civil servants. So it's clearly not worked. Uh, and it does need to. And even if it's not fulfilling uh, when people retire or move on, it can be done by natural wastage, which is such a horrible term, I know, but uh, you can promote within the civil service as well, make uh, people have, rather than hitting a glass ceiling, somewhere to go as well. But let's not start creating posts uh, just for the sake of it. Let's uh, use what we've got. Thank you. Graham we had the we had the Mars scheme, uh, paying off civil servants to take early redundancy, and now we have more than ever. What What's your view on the size of government? The Mars, the Mars was a, a really strange scheme because there was people that were moved into positions 
and then they were done away with. Um, but I think when we've got to deal with what people are wanting f the government to provide. You know, uh, we're saying that we need more services at the hospital, that will need more staff. We're saying that um, uh, we need more police, we need more uh, people teaching. That is more staff. So if we get more people over here, there will be more people employed. What we have to do is make sure that they're in the right place. What we've seen with Manx Care and when they did the review into the Department of Education, it actually created more jobs. So these independent reviews have come along and said, right, well, the best way to get a better service is to employ more people. Well, surely what we need to do is make sure that the people who are doing the jobs now are doing them properly. And I think one of the areas that we, we have to address is in, in the senior levels of, across the civil service is that um, when the next administration comes in, as we see in other jurisdictions, then the people at the top are also up for their, their jobs as well. Because often you see the minister will change, but the advisors to the minister will stay. So that's areas that we need, that we need to look at. Should you be in favour of putting senior civil servants on fixed term performance related contracts? Yes. And it was, it was disappointing back in two, 2006 that there was a review of pay when uh, the administration was in Perda and there was a, a big pay rise agreed for senior civil servants. And, you know, I think that's, that system has to be broken. Thank you. Steve Crowther? I think one of the key areas that we, you know, I, even at the last election I made clear that one of the difficulties is, number one, we have Brexit coming. And I recognised immediately that the renegotiation and that change alone would bring um, an increase. The significant way, as, I, as I've just reiterated, um, I have to reiterate, the key thing is partnering. The key thing is making, if we want to slim down government and we want to be more efficient, it's joining things together and making sure that we can partner up so that a lot of these extra resources are just simply required to work with um, other you know, advisors or the consultants, which can be a lot more efficient. If they're not employed by government, if they're employed by the... I'll give a good example, the airport. It was a desperate situation, the, uh, and it's fundamental to our constituency. We keep ignoring it. It's just a bus stop to Douglas. You know, the thing is, it offers so much more, and it's a national um, structure. If you have a look in, at the airport, we have a key problem at the moment with, um, you know... Well, number one, the front of it doesn't look very good. Uh, the actual process of, um, you know, goods delivery um, and, you know, the whole process of, of working the airport, it's been desperately in need of restructuring. That's perfectly the example for joining in and making sure we partner. Somebody's prepared to run that for 20 years. They want an exit strategy. They just want to know that they can... Um, Plenty of people to partner with out there at the moment. You mentioned about the Bank of England. You're absolutely right. We could be in a very difficult uh, circumstances in the next few years. But if, someone, if we give someone a clear strategy, we have the real potential to deliver something. And let's be honest, you know, if you look at air travel or these type of areas, they, the fundamental is making sure that it's more, much more efficient. Quite a lot of the flight travel, the energy used is you in the actual terminal. There's so much more that we can represent environmentally and also in terms of our, the projection of our image, just as I want with the Climate Technology Park research. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to move it on to another subject. Um, according to Isle of Man government figures put out in 2019, people are twice as likely to be killed or seriously injured on the Isle of Man's roads than they are in England. As one of only a small handful of countries in the world with de-restricted roads and our own current road safety strategy stating the nature of our roads is part of the culture of the Isle of Man, do you think we should have speed limits on all our roads? Tim Glover. Sadly, yes, I do. And that's obviously going to go against Why what sadly? you're doing. Well, because you're probably expecting me to say, no, the mountain road should remain unrestricted. Well, there'd be no it's restrictions on the uh, speed limits for the races. No. But uh, this, is on, this is on, obviously, open roads. I do. I mean, we've had, obviously, a serious crash up on the mountain road today, and the road's been closed for, for hours. Uh, there were blue lights flashing towards Port Air and through Colby. I don't know what that exactly was, but... 
I actually do feel that we do need to look at the speed limits uh, a lot more carefully, but it's all very well saying, yes, let's put in speed limits, but they've got to be policed at the same time. Uh, you, you, you can put in a 20 mile an hour zone and still people will be going through at 40 unless uh, there are uh, design specifics put in to slow traffic down or it's actually policed. And I am in favour of uh, uh, what's being mooted and that is that uh, mobile speed cameras come in uh, and uh, okay, there won't be prosecutions from that, but there will be data gathered from what I gather. There will be prosecutions now. Uh, there will be data gathered um, through number plate recognition, etc., of people that are speeding in areas. Thank Speed you. is a big issue. Thank you. Graham Cajine. Yes. Obviously, a close interest in this. Yeah, the, 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 the mobile speed cameras that we're talking about. Um, they, there will be prosecutions from it because it is it's calibrated equipment. And, and one of the areas that, uh, when we were doing, talking about neighbourhood policing was actually working with local authorities. And some of the local authorities there have staff. Um, I know Malou have got a, a speed gun. So what you could actually do is you can encourage them to go out. They may not be able to do prosecutions, but they can pass on the registration number uh, and the speed to the police who then can go and uh, advise uh, the individuals. What, Sounds a bit yes, dangerous to Yes, it has. It, it has been used. Um, and, and one of the, what, what you've got to look at is, now some of these incidents, uh, whether they're in a 30 or a 40, is it the speed that's actually caused the accident? Is it people that have been drink driving or is, it, is there another cause for that? And when you're looking at speeding, you know, uh, if you put a 40 mile speed limit and somebody goes through at 60 and crashes, that's the other point. But you can go around the island and we've got inappropriate speed limits in the wrong area they're in the wrong areas you know you've got single file lanes that are de-restricted that you could possibly you know why don't they just put a 20 in there because it's it's so narrow what you need to do is actually have enforcement the mobile speed cameras will start to do that and we need to have that review of what is an appropriate speed limit and where but on the mountain road there's no speed limit so Th there you, isn't you can't you can't break the law. But you Would can. you have you, a speed limit you, on the mountain road? But you road? can, because it all depends if they're dangerous driving or driving without due care and attention. Can that be measured by a speed gun, though? Uh, by a speed gun. Well, can uh, inappropriate driving be measured well, by yeah, a speed gun? Because what, if the, after the incident, they can go and see what the skid marks were, and, and all the, so they will get that data. Jason Morehouse, why is the Isle of Man one of only a handful of countries in the world not to have a maximum speed limit? I think it's tradition, and it's also that reluctance to actually change what we've got. Many people see it as being a valuable part of our community. So it's tradition over, over yeah. accidents and lives, yes? And, and in terms of going forward, that it means that we've got to have a whole community discussion over this. It can't be brought in by politicians or other people. It's got to be seen as for the community, by the community. And that is really important. What's your view as what you're being asked? Well, in terms of me, I do, I do re recognise there is that peak that is causing issues at the moment. People think that for them, they can go at any speed and there will be no consequences. And there are consequences. And it's actually seen on many of our rural roads in our constituency, there are places that are dangerous. There are villages like St Mark's and we've tried various ways to actually resolve that problem. And the mobile speed camera is potentially the only thing that will guarantee that we can have action that is seen to be taking place. At the moment, it's a matter of luck whether there's going to be a policeman there with a speed gun. Would you have a speed limit on the mountain road? Um, I think it's one of those things that it needs to be looked at. Um, in terms and, and of, it, well, in, in terms of speed limit, opinion? It, yeah, in terms of speed limit, if you look at something like 100 miles per hour, then it's very, very fast, and it's so going the to same as the autobahns in Germany. Yeah? yeah. So I think in the first instance, rather than have, yeah, on we, a, need, on to go, on we need to go high and then kind of single lane highways on it. Yeah. What would be a B road in the in the UK? Yeah. yeah so okay. so something, but we, we don't want to be in a situation where people simply challenge it. So going through Balasala, it's 20 miles per hour. At the moment, it's just being ignored. To bring in a new change that can't be enforced, that people ignore, is stupid. So yeah, it needs to be something with teeth. Thank you. Steve Crowther, we have speed limits on most of our roads, but not yep. all of our roads. What, what would, what's well, your view? Was that answer the vote for two presidents? <laughs> Don't, not quite sure there. What, what I'd like to answer is that 
you know, let's just step back with the bigger picture. The key thing is not just about the mountain road. Specifically, uh, obviously, the figures you have don't state where those accidents are. And to be fair, there was a comment that the 20 mile an hour is very unenforceable, as in many areas. But the fundamental to our constituents is another perfect example. We don't have the full structural review for our area that's really worked. It doesn't show capacity. It doesn't show the key areas that we have problems with. And that's exactly how we need to go forward. We need a strong review, a strategic review, a traffic review of our area. Some of that's already there. We just need to pull it together and we need it clear and transparent to government. Sorry, Steve, what's your, what's your gut feeling on a speed limit for the no, mountain road? I don't want to put one on them. Not, not on the... Uh, not on the main mountain run. I think why, that's, why not? Well, because I believe it's something that has been tradition and it's there. It's something that people travel to the Isle of Man for. I think if it, I think if you can give warnings to people over time that, that that's not, you know, it's, it's going to come if they don't uh, behave better, then, and it is police, bit, you know, quite strongly. So, you know, are people, I'd like to know, are people being prosecuted, how much is it really changing their behaviour? It's not just the mountain road, is it? Just at the moment, we're allowing, we've got a conflict between the biosphere, which is saying that all the side roads have to be um, left to be wilding, but there's quite a lot of very dangerous junctions at the moment that appear, you can't see around them. So, you know, these are, you can see these sort of conflicts, and this is what I'm saying about a strategic review of our roads. We really need a bigger picture. Tim? Just briefly, I think it does need to be a, a strategic review because without it, and you drive anywhere uh, around the Isle of Man, there are far too many signs, yeah. far too many signs that are actually just littering the countryside because the whole policy of uh, where speed uh, should be addressed and where it should be at a higher speed hasn't really been... It's not applied, I don't think, with any real consistency. It seems to be a hodgepodge. And we have some very bad junctions that just seem to be left. We don't seem to be picking them up. Thank you. So, just want to move on to climate change related question. Um, this is about the Isle of Man government's ambition to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. Is that too unambitious? Jason Morehouse? I think it's a starting point, and I'm disappointed that we haven't actually started moving towards it at greater speed. A lot of people wanted to have an earlier target, and possibly that earlier target would have created that enthusiasm and that jump forward. Um, we saw the, the grants and support that were offered by the Ministry in July, and there's, there's something, but we need to have more. People need to feel part of this. At the moment, there's too many big schemes. It's all about the expensive car all about the windmill all about the things that the ordinary man and woman are finding difficult to relate to in terms of priorities we need to get back to things like um insulation that people put in the houses that then they'll actually benefit from in terms of low energy bills and actually see the benefits and then go forward and do other things it really needs to involve the local people and then we can move forward at a faster rate definitely thank you steve crowther <laughs> Climate change, uh, I mean, obviously, it's fundamental to our youth uh, and our future. Um, the, you asked about the date. Um, it would be very interesting. Um, Ove Arup, well, Arups, as they're now known, have just released a new climate um, resources, what do they call it, scenario. I'd be interested to know if our two incumbents have actually read that. It's only been released, been released a month ago now. Uh, that's talking about some of those strategies. We've paid a lot of money for it. I'd like to think they've read it. Um, you see, the key thing uh, that I think Jason's alluding to is affordability. It's this transition. And that's exactly why I worked so hard on this new eco house. It's the affordable aspect. And really, um, looking at some of the new technologies that are coming, this is, you know, Manx solutions for Manx problems. This is exactly why we need the, uh, you know, uh, climate change technology research uh, opposite the airport. There is a way forward, particularly with hydrogen. There's a lot of options that we have. This is exactly what I've covered in my manifesto. Um, but it's the affordability. It's vital that we remember that uh, we don't introduce now a climate divide. But we can meet those dates. We have the facilities on the island. We have the new technology that's growing. Um, Rent Sustainable, who developed the Eco House, spent 20 years developing that. So things are now coming 
uh, to fruition. We just need to bring them together. Thank you. Tim Thank Glover? You. I think the key is, as Steve's just alluded to there, the, the affordability, but we've got that technology gateway at the airport where we could be attracting green industry to the island, which is not only going to create jobs as well, it's actually going to help pay for the big economic hit that we're going to face as an island. It's going to make it more affordable if we can make that a success. And again, we go back to it. It's about having a government that's got confidence. It's going to be prepared to actually uh, encourage things to actually happen. It's, it's so disappointing that five years on, we've mm. still got that gateway just growing grass and seed and nothing happening on it. It's a complete missed opportunity and one that we must not miss out on again because it, economically it could help pay for the change that's coming. And for our young. So net zero emissions by earlier than 2050? I would, I would like to see us being more ambitious. Thank you. Graham Crudeen. What we've got to do is we've got to find solutions for space heating because most people will either have oil boilers, gas boilers for their properties. It's all very well talking about new housing and then being green and sustainable, but we have a large propor uh, proportion of properties on the Isle of Man who've got oil and gas boilers. We can't just turn that into electric heating. Our infrastructure will not be able to cope with that. You know, if you imagine in our, in our constituency there, you have large housing estates. If you took the oil and gas boilers out of those, you would not be able to supply them with electricity to, to, for all their needs of space heating and lighting. There may be ways that we can look at hydrogen through the gas main, and there may be uh, ways of looking at into the future where they've actually got um, hydrogen boilers and, and hydrogen generators for your property so you can fuel your cars up. Now what we've got to do is we've got to look at what's going to be available. I think it will be naive to, to say that we will bring all these world-leading technology companies over to the Isle of Man and they're going to invest here. They are looking for a mass market and that mass market is, is, is going to make that business sustainable for them. But it's happened, it's happened on Orkney, yeah. Graham, because yeah. they, they have got a business that actually is set up and tests all the tidal power generators. They've made it into a business, so all the world's companies are actually going to Orkney but, to test out their and, new and what technology. You're in Coming, so have it can you read be the done report? if we're ambitious. I've, yes, I've got the report and I've started reading through it. What well, I'm, so you haven't got to the conclusion then? No, I haven't, because oh, right, you know, okay. some of us are still, we've still got council of ministers, we're still dealing with I'm COVID. I'm an architect, I run we're, every We're day. still de dealing with COVID. Now, one of the areas that we've got to look at is what can we afford? Because we're still saying that we've got all this uh, infrastructure that we've got to change. We've got the debt from COVID. We've got that, the health service that we've got to turn around. This is going to take money. Now, you, you're talking about uh, in Scottish islands. What you've got here is a population of 85,000-ish. Right? We have a lot of housing in areas that we need to find a sustainable solution for energy supply to them. Now, if we can get some of those companies over here, but don't forget, part of what they will be looking for is what government assistance there will be. And when you look at that, there's been a, a recent um, wind, uh, sorry, a sea turbine, and the companies developed that, but they are now going to the UK government for many millions of pounds of subsidy for generating electricity. We have the area of, of uh, Laxey, which was previously out to Dong Energy for wind turbines. So there's those areas there, but ultimately it is what is going to be affordable. So just quick response is 2050 about right or would you bring it forward if elected or it's, it's very difficult it forward it's, it's very difficult because you're, you're talking nearly 30 years and technology can change quite quickly and so you're on the fence no i'm not on the fence what i'm saying is if we can get bring it in quicker great but if, if we put it too far out there is n nothing to aspire to okay but you'll have read the report yes thank you thank you and thank you that wraps up our questions for this event. All that remains now is for each candidate to have their final word on why they should get your vote. And we start off with Jason Morehouse. Thank you. The next five years will be a challenge, but we've got the potential to achieve amazing things. The impact of COVID and Brexit will not be felt in the coming days. Businesses are taking stock of the current situation and they will be carrying out rationalisation in the coming months. Government must be there to support and encourage those businesses to go on. 
They are the fuel of our economy, the growth and the employees of our local people. Five years ago, I asked for change. I'm now ready to, to activate, activate that change. I've got the skills and I've got the mentality that will enable us to go forward. Our government is too much like, oh, you're being served. We need to have that Google effect. We need to be working together for the island, for the people, and bringing new ideas and new initiatives. It's not simply a case of standing still. We need to move forward. If we stand still, we're going backwards. We need to look at our young people. We need to invest in them, ensure that the houses are there for them in terms of the private sector, so they, they can afford to rent and live in happily or they have the opportunities to buy. We almost must ensure that the economy has got strength and that must be the key priority. I'm tried, tested and ready to be reactivated. Thank you. Thank you. Tim Glover. I think tonight demonstrates it's about actions and not words. And I think we need a government that is going to be ambitious is going to be sound-footed, think strategically, and thoughtful policies is essential for the way forward. We've heard too much of the same things from five years ago still coming up on the agenda with no actions. The airport technology gateway being a prime example of something that was talked about with such eagerness five years ago and nothing has happened. We need a government for the people. We need a government that is gonna work for all the people and not just for those with influence. It needs a social conscience as well. We need to cut out bureaucracy. We need to work in a much smarter and thoughtful way. I've been a commentator. Hopefully my time as a commentator is coming to an end. It's time for me to step out onto the pitch and be an active player for your team. Thank you, Tim. Steve Crowther. Yeah, I think as, as Tim said, the main concern is that we at the moment have had the same. Do they want to deliver the same? And that's what you'd have to vote for. The key thing for me is that we have an incredible constituency. It was newly combined at the last election. I said that the two MHKs must work together. They must empower the local authorities to take their areas forward and really bring us something new. And as we've said, the school, the housing, the technology park have just not come to fruition. They haven't even got off the ground. Some are buried. So we now need to get the momentum into the next administration and we need to do it quickly. As, as has been alluded, we could face some serious interest rate rises. Hospitality, uh, some of the key areas in our you know, uh, retail, uh, travel, uh, face really hard times in the coming, uh, the coming administration. So we have to move quickly. It's really attracting the right inward investment, projecting the right image, and government communicating far better. It's, it's absolutely essential. The environmental issue and the biosphere are how we can bring things together. And it's the ethics, that's the key, making sure that investors are clear as to where we want to go. If I'm given the honour of being elected, I know that I can deliver the things that I'm actually talking about. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Graham Critchin. The next administration will need people who are not afraid to make tough decisions. Over my time in the House of Keys and in Tinwald, I have shown that I have not been afraid to take those decisions even sometimes when they've been unpopular. This has been always in the best interest of the people of the Isle of Man and our economy. I have a record of actually achieving things. We started off uh, in my first term of having uh, Crossig Farm reviewed, Poacher's Pocket planning, also um, government properties. In this administration, we've brought forward the Castle Russian High School. This is a multi-million pound development and, and this has actually been brought forward and it was put in the pink book within the first two years of this administration. It's in the pink it was, it, so it was within, it, it's in the pink book and it is being progressed. You will see that the playing fields are there. Environmentally, it's got uh, ground source heat pumps in there. We've got tuition uh, grants for students on low incomes so that they can achieve what they want by going to university. During my time in the Department of Home Affairs, we've seen um, neighborhood policing brought back we have now a border agency making the island more secure. P 
People should vote for people with experience. I have that experience, and I hope the people of Arbury, Castletown and Maloo believe that I have that. Thank you. Thank you, Graham, and thank you again to the candidates for attending and giving us their views. They are Graham Crajean, Steve Crowther, Tim Glover, and Jason Morehouse. Now, it's over to you. Where will your vote be going on September the 23rd? Thank you for watching. Goodbye.